This is BBC One running 15 minutes later than planned. Now a bit of a Christmas feel for the sky at night. Good evening. For this programme, we are going to be very topical. The Star of Bethlehem. What was it? The Star in the East, one of the great mysteries that no one's yet solved. Was there anything there, or was there not? And we're going to try and answer some of those questions in this programme. First of all, a few news notes. And the Leonid Meteors. Well, they did put out a good show, and they have some lovely pictures in. Here's a picture from George Danos. Look at the meteor streaming across the sky there. And this one from Mike Bostjat. And this lovely picture here from Martin Mobley. And there we have a fireball. And there in the background, you can see the constellation of Orion. And that was pretty spectacular. Well, uh, as I say, we didn't see a great deal from here. But in another program, John Mason, who was over in the Pacific, he's going to come and give us a more detailed account. Near our home, we've had our first showings of our new South Downs Planetarium in Chichester. And here's our very nice Japanese projector. The grand opening is going to be in the spring by the Astronomer Royal, but we have started to give shows now, and we'll be in full operation after Christmas. Now, there have been two very interesting fireballs. One on October the 27th, and that shot right across England, and we have very useful reports in, such as this one by Nick Cowling, showing it streaking over Derby Cathedral. Another on December the 1st, and this was really spectacular. In Brighton, Jay Buckler was fishing, and this thing shot across. Apparently, really spectacular, and here's what he was able to give us of it, because he's a graphic artist, and therefore, this is very accurate indeed. What was it? We think we know this was part of a re-entering Russian rocket. If you did see it, and did have accurate observations, then please let us know, and we'll give you the address at the end of the program. And now, on to the Star of Bethlehem, and two points I must make. First of all, it may be just a story. It may be supernatural. We are not uh, going into the religious aspect. We're dealing with pure science. So let's try and find out what it was, and more importantly, what it wasn't. I have with me Professor David Hughes, Dr. Mark Kidger. We've all written books about the Star of Bethlehem, and we come to totally different conclusions. So first of all, David, may I come to you? There's only one reference in the Bible, and nowhere else. You're right. It's only in Matthew chapter 2. And it's only mentioned four times in that chapter. And when we read, it, started, it happened when Herod was on the throne, and these wise men saw it in the eastern sky when they were in their own country. And more importantly, what they saw had a message for them, and that was the new king of the Jews being born. So they decided to pay homage to this new king and went to Jerusalem, which was the wrong place. But when they got there, Herod hadn't seen anything unusual and he inquired when the star had happened. Looking in the Old Testament, Micah, they were told that actually the birth would take place in Bethlehem, so they then had this further five miles to go due south. As they left Jerusalem, they saw the star again and were very happy to see this, and it went before them and stood over where the young child was. And those are the only clues we've got and we three gentlemen have then had to write complete books just on those clues. What about St. James? St. James was a much later book which didn't quite make it into the Bible and of course dear St. James exaggerated so much. He said the star was exceedingly bright. Other stars paid homage to this very, very bright star. Whereas in Matthew, there's no adjective. It's just a normal star which could be either a wandering one, a shooting one, or a hairy one, or a new one. I don't believe St. James. I think he's just exaggerating. In the same way, for example, as the Magi, who were simply wise men in Matthew, have now become kings and have become saints and have actually got names. Well, Mark, um, what about the time scale? Well, we're fairly sure that the Star of Bethlehem appeared sometime between 7 BC and 4 BC. Uh, we know that it appeared during the reign of Herod. We've got very good reason to believe that uh, Herod died in 4 BC because we know he died just after a lunar eclipse that was seen from Jericho uh, and there was an eclipse about a month before Passover in 4 BC, a partial eclipse, 35%, and that gives us a good handle on when Herod actually died. So we assume the star was seen 
two to three years before then. That gives us something anyway, but uh, what about the Magi themselves? That's a very good question because really we've got no idea who the Magi were from any real evidence. Uh, we know they weren't kings because the idea they were kings was only introduced around about the 6th century. Uh, some people think that they came from Babylon. I think David holds that view. Uh, my own personal view is that they probably came from Persia and Zoroastrian priests, astrologers, uh, who would have seen the star and they would have produced some special significance from this star that may not have been obvious to ordinary people. Well, let's now try and sum up various requirements, shall we? Uh, what can the star have been? First of all, it must have been unusual. We do know the time scale, and probably was not seen by everybody. So let's now go through one of the less likely theories and see what it definitely was not. And there are plenty of those. First of all, ball lightning, a low-level atmospheric phenomenon. I don't think that fits to you, David. It's got one advantage, and that is it would hover over a specific stable and point it out. But in essence, I don't think that was necessary, and I agree with you entirely. Then uh, next, um, aurorae, polar lights. Well, here's a lovely picture by Ian Law, but um, I don't think that fits either. You don't often see them from there. No, that would almost, again, be an advantage. But the aurorae, it would be very unusual to see a bright display so far south. Uh, and also, you'd expect to see it in the north. And if, as David says, the star was seen in the east, that really doesn't fit at all. In the zodiacal light, I, I took this picture from La Palma. It's a lovely phenomenon, but um, what do you think about that one? Too commonplace. I mean, you've got to have something that's fairly rare here, I think. And then, of course, one strange idea, the planet Uranus. Only just visible with the naked eye, and I see no merit in that whatsoever. Yes, that's a very interesting, very unusual idea. And the idea was that it passed very close to two bright planets in the years uh, around the time that we're interested, and it might have been noticed passing close to But if they detected Uranus by the naked eye, you'd expect them to detect asteroids like Vesta as well. You and indeed. they didn't. And then, of course, the old shock pile, the planet Venus. And Venus can be very brilliant indeed, as it is in the morning sky at the present moment. But what do you think about Venus? I think you wouldn't be a very wise man if you'd been fooled by Venus. Exactly. So, no, what, do you agree on that, Mark? Absolutely, yes. I, if, as you've said many times, if the wise men were fooled by Venus, they can't have been very wise. Absolutely so. Next idea, variable stars. I mean, some stars do vary, we know that, but there are no bright variable stars seen around that time, I don't think, as far as I know. Well, no message associated with them. It has to be associated with this new king of the Jews, and that worries me there. And then what about a supernova? Now, these can be really brilliant. Here, that lovely picture of a supernova that flared up in the large Magellanic cloud. Over on the right-hand side there, you see the, the, uh, the, the pre-nova, the tiny dot, and then on the left-hand side, the brilliant thing there. Again, no supernova reported around there? Yes, exactly. Uh, this is a theory Arthur C. Clarke made popular in the 1950s, but we have catalogued all the supernovae that occurred in our galaxy around that time. The nearest one is 185 AD, and really there is no supernova ar around 5, 6, 7 BC, none at all. Best. And a bright supernova, of course. I mean, everybody yeah, I would have been talking was, about it, including yes, Hera. Of course they would. And then, of course, comets. Not Halley's Comet. That came in much too early. But what about comets? Well, here's a picture of a comet linear taken by Martin Mobley. What about a comet to start a bit for him, David? Well, comets at least do stand over. And this is one thing seriously in their favour. But... Again, they just generally refer to doom and disease and death and disaster and not to a new king of the Jews. Now, what do you think, Mark? Uh, well, we've got another reason to disbelieve a comet, and that is that there are many Chinese chronicles from the time, yeah. and the Chinese recorded everything they saw carefully. They recorded Halley's Comet in 12 BC, and there is no report whatsoever of a bright comet about this time. No, I don't think comets fit the bill. And now one very strange thing, a strange theory put forward, that may have been an occultation of a planet. And we've got here a lovely video sent by Mr. A. H. Bates from Waverton, and the rear of Saturn from behind the moon. You see, there's the moon's limb. You see Saturn poke out from the right-hand side. It's a lovely picture, but uh, I can't see an occultation being the star of Bethlehem, can you? Even if the Magi had seen something like this, I'm not convinced they would know where to go or why to do the journey. No, I'm more my, I think I'm not well, convinced of that. Uh, I, there, there are two problems. Um, I, I disagree with David. I th there is an astrological message, but in fact it's the wrong one. Uh, that an occultation of 
Jupiter actually predicted the death of a great king, not the birth of a new king. And the second problem was that the occultation, this had been proposed by Michael Molnar, uh, would have been absolutely impossible to see. You yeah. would only have seen it yeah. with a telescope. Yeah. And we don't think the Mage Eye had telescopes. No telescopes in those days. No, well, we've disposed of quite a lot of things. Now, let's come on to the possibilities. And we've all got different theories. And, David, you made a very, very long study of the Star of Bethlehem. And can we have your ideas, please? Well, my idea is it was just two perfectly normal planets, Saturn and Jupiter, moving through the constellation of Pisces and coming together in that constellation three times. Now this happened in 7 BC. The first time they came together was in April and then the second time was in October. So this gives you plenty of opportunity to find the gifts, collect up the camels and travel all that journey from Babylon to Jerusalem. But wouldn't the Major have known about that? They would. They would have predicted it and therefore they would have been very happy to see their prediction come true when they left Jerusalem and they saw this coming together for the second time. What do you think about that one, Mark? Well, I, I think the triple conjunction was significant. I think that told the Magi something is about to happen. And I agree with David on a lot of what he's saying. I think they looked at it, they realized that something special was going to happen uh, in Judea. Uh, but they wanted another sign that they'd seen conjunctions, they'd seen triple conjunctions previously. They wanted another definitive sign. Now we know that the Chinese observed something very interesting in February, March, April of 5 BC. Uh, it's a star that appeared in the south of Aquila. Uh, the Chinese observed it for something like two and a half months, so it must have been fairly prominent. They only lost it when the monsoon season started and the clouds would have covered the sky and stopped them seeing the star completely. And that looks very much as if it was a quite bright nova. And my own idea is the Magi were alerted by the triple conjunction, then they saw the nova, and they said, now. That nova would have been visible low in the dawn sky. Uh, it would have fit quite nicely. And if they'd taken two, three months to arrive at Bethlehem, it would have actually been due south at dawn. They'd have gone from Jerusalem to Bethlehem following the star at dawn. Can you identify the nova? It's a long shot, Patrick. It's a very long shot. And I did find one star. Uh, there, there's a star called Dio Aquili, which is quite close to the position that is given for uh, the Chinese star in 5 BC. It was a nova in 1927. It was not naked eye visible. It was magnitude 7. It's a very, very long shot. <laughs> but What's your views on that one, David? I'm not too keen on the nova because, of course, it's not got this astrological message. And personally, as you know, I like the conjunction. To me, the conjunction has everything, and the whole thing can be over in 7 BC, and you don't have to wait for 5 BC for something else to happen. How also, of course, they would just be... There's no use the Magi standing there simply waiting, because they didn't know a nova was going to take place. They could have been still waiting for something to happen. But the nova wouldn't have behaved in, in an unusual way, would it? No, it, it would have brightened up. They'd have seen a, a bright star in the east at dawn. Uh, it would have said... you know. This is the sign you've been waiting for. This is the definitive sign. And it would have faded down over a period of weeks or months. You say weeks or months. Again, Herod could have seen it, couldn't he? He could have seen it, or he might have just been unlucky. It might have been cloudy at that time. I mean, we just don't know him. We've got such slim evidence that we really don't know what happened and why Herod didn't see it. Or maybe Herod's courtiers did see it, and they preferred not to tell him anything about it. That might have been a wise course if they thought it was going to be a rival king. We still have the problem of the movement, don't we? How it went for and stood over where the young child lay. I never wouldn't do that. That's a showstopper. Yeah. Stars don't do this. And of no. course a star that's standing over Bethlehem is standing over everywhere in that area anyway. So we're all in trouble there, I think. Yes, but um, my own theory, as you know, it was either one or two meteors. Now a meteor do fill one of the aquariums, but very unusual, could have been very bright. And they do move. Of course, they don't go and stand over the place where the young child lay, but they do move. And after all, if there were a couple of bright meteors going in the same direction, they would have been seen by the wise men, and they wouldn't be seen by Herod. What do you think of that one? Well, what worries me there, Patrick, is that these wise astronomers in Babylon would have been looking at the sky regularly, 
and would have been seeing meteors at very regular intervals. In this program, we've been talking about two lovely meteors we've seen. So I don't think they would be that special, and I can't see them having any astrological message such that they have to get the presents together and make this long journey. And to me also, meteors don't indicate where to go, which in this case, of course, was Jerusalem. They only get the direction, though, couldn't they, quite easily? Oh, they would certainly point in a direction, Which, yes. which so your conjunction can't do, and your, and your nerva can't do. But as nights progress, these meteors, different meteors, will be pointing in a whole range of different directions. We have had occasion of meteor procession. Remember the, the Sulilids? Exactly. There, that was a meteor shower with the scene at the start of the last century. A very unusual phenomenon. It's not really been explained where over a period of some mi minutes, one meteor after another just followed each other across the sky in a stately procession. Now, that would have been a very interesting phenomenon. However, I, I, there is this other problem with meteors. They're very short-lived phenomena. And a, a typical meteor, you see it for less than a second, even a very bright one, you only see it for a few seconds. And that is a problem. How would the Magi follow a bright meteor across a journey that, if you're like David, you think they came from Babylon, or like me, from Persia? That's hundreds and hundreds of miles of distance. And it seems to be a lot to ask of a meteor. I agree, but it does indicate the direction, doesn't it? Yes, uh, certainly you have got that point. If it was a meteor that was seen heading east to west across the sky, that would have given them a sign. Go west, young man. <laughs> well, there we have it. Three ideas, all different, and I wonder which is going to be correct, if any. Of course, I think you have one very important point here, Mark, but you give a, a combination of things, not one particular phenomenon. I, I really think that that's it, eh? because if it were one single phenomenon, surely in 2,000 years we'd have come up with a definitive explanation. The fact there are so many phenomena that have been suggested shows that no single phenomenon is a, is a convincing explanation on its own. I know David will disagree with me, but I, I do feel that very strongly. What do you feel about that, David? Well, I personally still think that it's this coming together of Jupiter and Saturn, and I think the Chronicle Rising, when they rose in the east as the sun was setting in the west, Tuesday the 15th of September, 7 BC, was the actual day on which Jesus was born. Well, as we know, we have that only that one passage in the Bible, nothing else to guide us. And I just wonder, I, is that chance at all a chance, you think, we'll find any other references anywhere? There's always a chance. I mean, you see these Dead Sea Scrolls coming forward, and maybe we're going to come across some record of Jesus' birthday. And this would be fascinating, because we certainly know it isn't December the 25th. No. But then, more or less every period, spring, autumn, for example, is in fact open to us. Any chance of any other references, do you think, Mark? I agree with David. If we could really tie down the date of the birth of Jesus, some wonderful piece of evidence comes up. One of us is going to be in an awful lot of trouble, because we differ <laughs> by two years. Well, I just wonder. We may never know. David? Mark, thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Patrick. And now let's see what our viewers think. We're going to have a vote. Do you think David is right? Do you think Mark is right? Think I'm right? Or do you think we are all wrong? Please let us know. Go to our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash space, or of course turn to CFAX page 620. If you did see that fireball, please let us know. Either email it or send your report to this address, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W12 7TS. And I hope it's not too early to wish you all a very happy Christmas. Good night.